I read in a paper that um, Nuremberg was looking for interpreters, German, English, English, German, French, English, etc. And I had been a translator at the first United Nations conference in San Francisco while I was working at the Office of War Information. And so I went over to the um, War Department. It, the Defense Department was then called the, the War Department. So I went over to the War Department for an interview. And the colonel who interviewed me was Colonel Mickey Marquis, who was the one who was glorified and cast a giant shadow. He was the first American officer who was killed in the Israeli War of Independence. He was a very nice man. And then I was interviewed by him and by the man who had been the head of the translation section at the United Nations, so I had no difficulty. So then I wrote my parents and said I was going to go to Nuremberg. And uh, my parents were not amused. They thought that I'd been, we'd been through enough and seen enough and you don't need to go. Well, I said I wanted to go. So my father wrote me this wonderful letter, which I've misplaced because my brother asked me for the letter, in which he said, you belong to that generation disenfranchised by Hitler but as you go to do justice, be just. And uh, I was only a small potato, you know. Justice was not the kind of thing that we could affect. So, um, and he also said, don't forget to, that you're a Jew. I saw Goering, I was interpreting for him. He was the number one man in Germany after after Hitler. And he looked terrible because he had been on drugs and they took his drugs away. So he was on withdrawal and lost about 100 pounds. And uh, he wasn't particularly thrilled to have a female and a Jew as an interpreter. But uh, we were there in the interpreting room. Hess, who was the number three man in, uh, in, um, in the German hierarchy, who feigned, we thought he feigned, uh, amnesia. And so we showed a movie with him in it to see what his reaction would be, and he reacted somewhat. We also showed movies of him at the Nuremberg um, uh, uh, festivals, the Nazi festivals, the party days. And this is why actually the trial was held in Nuremberg. You know, it was sort of the end of the period of their reign. And as you know, a lot of people committed suicide uh, among the defendants. Hitler killed himself. Goebbels, who was the propaganda chief, killed himself and his wife and seven children. We were hoping that this would pave the way for the vanquished to be able to try the victors. It didn't happen. But we thought that if, if you have an outline of the kinds of indictments you want to draw, draw conspiracy to wage, wage aggressive war, war, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Then within that framework, uh, you could prove almost everything. And the indictment was based on the Geneva Conventions of the century before in, in, in the 20s. And so uh, our prosecution was very conscientious in referring back to the conventions. So, I mean, there were a lot of lawyers who said this was ex post facto. In other words, they made the laws um, that they asked the defendants to adhere to after the, they had committed their war crimes. But as you can see now about Bosnia and Kosovo, the legacy of Nuremberg is still with us.